Plato once told a story about Socrates' day in the Athenian army. It seems that one evening the philosopher's attention was so caught by a new idea so completely that he simply stood and stared and reflected all night until daybreak, at which time he said his prayers and went on about his duties. Not many people get that involved in ideas, but it has been the great blessing of this university to have on its faculty a man about whom similar stories can be and are truly reported. We have come to take at face value a line such as this from his own pen. As an infant, I entertained an abiding conviction that there were things of transcendent import awaiting my attention." Close quote. If that image conjures up to you the scene of a diapered baby in a playpen reading Tertullian and the Encyclopedia Judaica, then you've got the picture. <laughs> the contributions of Professor Hugh W. Nibley to this university to the church which sponsors it and the world at large are too numerous to list or even summarize in this brief introduction. We could well simply read aloud Truman Madsen's foreword to our Religious Studies Center publication, Nibley on the Timely and the Timeless. Or we could read Professor Nibley's own intellectual biography printed there. Or we could read Gary Gillum's marvelous Nibley quote book, but I leave all of those to you. This morning I will only mention a few things which he has taught us through his writings, his classes and speeches, and through his consistently inspiring personal example. Given the unique mission of Brigham Young University, we are most grateful to Professor Nibley for teaching us, at, as this university's namesake taught, that first and last the gospel is learning unlimited. He has also taught us that humility is a mark of the true scholar and has helped us appreciate the limits of our academic disciplines, whether they be in language, literature, history, or science. He has helped us glimpse the implications of the scriptural characterization of the temple as a house of learning. He has taught repeatedly through the words of Brigham Young the nature and importance of true education, that Latter-day Saints have nothing to fear and everything to gain, from learning every art and science known to man, and that all these may be properly taught in the light of the gospel. And he's reminded us, he, he has reminded us of the damning effects of the pursuit of wealth when that pursuit tempts us to exploit our fellow beings or diverts us from the gospel of Jesus Christ. Satan's golden question, Hugh says, is have you any money? In his writings, best known to the membership of the church, Professor Nibley has shown us how the pursuit of even rather esoteric knowledge can be used to build up and defend the kingdom of God. With such preparation, he has dedicated a major portion of his professional life refuting, for example, the sponge theory of LDS origins, the view that the Book of Mormon and other modern revelations are nothing more than predictable expressions of the frontier American culture which Joseph Smith experienced in his youth. His frustration has been that in spite of the large accumulation of evidence showing authentically ancient origins for these new scriptures, many critics still refuse to read the books or examine that evidence, preferring instead to go on quoting each other, dismissing the most significant literary contributions of the 19th century in the process. Hugh Nibley's willingness to engage in open debate has kept such casual critics of the church at bay adding strength to his claim that their arguments cannot withstand rigorous public examination. And largely because of Professor Nibley's work, a few leading scholars have recognized his genius, acknowledge his scholarly competence, and consequently take these new scriptures seriously. He has also inspired a number of younger LDS scholars who share his testimony of the Restoration and now seek their own ways of using their learning to build and defend the kingdom of God. On the lighter side, we also know Professor Nibley is the subject of some of our richest campus folklore. It is, it is this is the hard part for me to restrain myself. Uh, it is said that he continued to wear his army fatigues and combat boots for almost a decade after the war was over, not wanting to lose any of the good wear left in them. 
And it is widely rumored that contemporary fashions haven't greatly influenced his wardrobe much since then either. <laughs> All who know him agree immediately with one friend's observation that going to Professor Nibley with a question is like going to a fire hydrant for a drink. <laughs> and who among us has not been amused, even encouraged, by his wry observation that there may be as much virtue in arising at nine o'clock to write a good book as in getting up at six to write a bad one? <laughs> the temptation to quote Hugh Nibley's wit would keep us here all day. We must move on to note his independence of thought and his ability to deflate our false pretensions and draw our attention sharply to our own foibles. Many of our, fa of our faults are widely shared, and the man among us who points them out will often be accused of iconoclasm. But Professor Nibley has demonstrated so clearly his own integrity and his absolute commitment to the gospel that he has won our unreserved confidence and respect. And he is therefore able to work freely within the system in addressing significant issues. He helps us keep our own humanity in perspective. The written citation in your graduation program indicates that for Hugh Nibley, life is a treasure hunt. For those of us who know and love him, Hugh himself is a treasure. To the extent that BYU has them, he is an institutional treasure. Heaven only knows there has never been one quite like him before, and we worry lest there should never be one quite like him again. Because of our profound gratitude to Hugh Winder Nibley for demonstrating that the life of scholarship is best lived as a life of faith, and pursuant to the authority conferred upon me as President of the University by the Board of Trustees, I hereby confer upon you, Hugh W. Nibley, the degree of Doctor of Letters, honoris causa. Twenty-three years ago today, if you will cast your minds back, on the same occasion I gave the opening prayer in which I said, quote, we have met here today clothed in the black robes of a false priesthood. Now, many have asked me since then whether I really said such a shocking thing, but nobody has ever asked what I meant by it. Why not? Well, some knew the answer already, and as for the rest, we do not question things at the BYU. But... <laughs> well, <laughs> I didn't expect that. But for my own relief, I welcome this opportunity to explain. Now, first, why a priesthood, false priesthood, remember? Because these robes originally denoted those who had taken clerical orders, and co a college was a mystery, with all the rites, secrets, oaths, degrees, tests, feasts, and solemnities that go with initiation into higher knowledge. But why false? Because it's borrowed finery, coming down to us through a long line of unauthorized imitators. It wasn't until 1893 that Boat here, an intercollegiate commission was formed to draft a uniform code for caps, gowns, and hoods in the United States. Before that, there were no rules. You could design your own. And that liberty goes as far back as these fixings can be traced. The late Roman emperors, as far as uh, we learn from the infallible Ducange, uh, marked each step in the decline of their power and glory by the addition of some new ornament to the resplendent vestments that proclaimed their sacred office and dominion. Branching off from them, the kings of the tribes, who inherited the lands and claims of the empire, vied with each other in imitating the Roman masters, determined to surpass even them in the theatrical variety and richness of caps and gowns. One of the four crowns worn by the emperor was the mortarboard. Oh, I left mine there on the floor. That's the one you're all wearing. The mortarboard. The French kings got it from Charlemagne, the model and founder of their royal lines, and to quote de Conge again, when the French kings quitted the palace at Paris to erect the Temple of Justice, at the same time they conferred their royal adornments on those who would preside therein, so that the judgment that came from their mouths would have more weight and authority with the people, as if they were coming from the mouth of the prince himself. That's the idea of the robe of the prophet descending on his successor. See? It is to these concessions, continues uh, Dicons, it is to these concessions that the mortarboards and scarlet and ermine robes of the chancellors of France and the presidents of parliament are to be traced. 
Their gowns are epitogia. The epitogia is this loose robe that's thrown over the rest of your clothing to produce the well-known greenhouse effect. And they're still, are still made in the ancient fashion. The name mortarboard, I'm still quoting to Kahn's, the name mortarboard is given to the diadem because it's shaped like a mortarboard which serves for mixing plaster. It's bigger on top than on the bottom, end of the quote. But where did the Roman emperors get it? Well, for one thing, the mortarboard was called a Justinianeion because of its use by the emperor Justinian who introduced it from the east. He got his court trappings and his protocol from the monarchs of Asia, in particular the Grand Shah from whom it can be traced to the Khans of the steppes and the Mongol emperors who wore the golden button of all wisdom on top of it. I have a button like that right on the top of mine. A golden button of all wisdom on the top of the cap even as I do. The shamans of the north also had it among the Laplanders. It's still called the cap of the four winds with its tassel and the rest. The four square headpiece topped by the golden tassel, the emergent flame of full enlightenment also figures in some Buddhist and lamest representations. But you get the idea. This Prospero suit is pretty strong medicine. Rough magic indeed. There's another type of robe. That's from Shakespeare incidentally. There's another type of robe and headdress described in Exodus and Leviticus, the third book of, of uh, Josephus' Antiquities. The white robe and linen cap of the Hebrew priesthood, which have close resemblance to some Egyptian vestments, they were given up entirely, however, by the passing of the, with the passing of the temple, were never even imitated after that by the Jews. Both their basic white and their peculiar design, especially as shown in the latest studies from Israel, are much like our own temple garments. Now, this is not the time or place to pursue a subject which Brother Packer has wisely recommends with judicious restraint. I bring it up only to ask myself, what if I appeared for an endowment session in the temple dressed in this outfit? And uh, that's, that's tomorrow I go to the temple. What if I went up there like this? There would be something incongruous about it, perhaps even comical. But why should that be so? The original idea behind both garments is the same, to provide a clothing more fitting to another ambience action and frame of mind than that of the warehouse, office, or farm. The 109th section of the Doctrine and Covenants describes the function and purpose of the temple as much the same as those of a university, a house where all seek learning by study and faith, by discriminating search among the best books. No official list is given. You must search them out. And by constant discussion, quoting again, diligently teaching one another words of wisdom Everybody seeking greater light and knowledge as all things come to be gathered in one. And of course, that's what a university is. All things gathered in one. Well, both the black and white robes proclaim then a primary concern for the things of the mind and the spirit. Sobriety of life and concentration of purpose removed from the largely mindless mechanical routines of your everyday world. Cap and gown announced that the wearer had accepted certain rules of living and been tested in special kinds of knowledge. What's wrong, then, with the flowing robes? For one thing, they're somewhat theatrical and too easily incline the wearer, beguiled by their splendor, to masquerade and affectation. In the time of Socrates, the sophists were making a big thing of their special manner of dress and delivery. The opening lines of Protagoras on that. It was all for show, of course, but it was dressing for success with a vengeance. For the whole purpose, the whole purpose of the rhetorical brand of education which they inaugurated and sold at top prices to the ambitious youth was to make the student successful as a paid advocate in the law courts, a commanding figure in public assemblies, or a successful promoter of daring business enterprises by mastering those irresistible techniques of persuasion and salesmanship which the sophists had to offer. He has some very good writings on that subject. Well, that was the classical education which Christianity embraced at the urging of the great St. Augustine. He had learned by hard experience that you can't trust revelation because you can't control it. The spirit blow, bloweth where it listeth, and what the church needed was something more available and reliable than that. Something, he says, commodior et multitudini tutior, handier and more reliable for the public, even than revelation or reason. And that's exactly what the rhetorical education had to offer. At the beginning of this century, scholars were strenuously debating the momentous transition from Geist to Amt, from spirit to office, from inspiration to ceremony, in the leadership of the early church, when the inspired leader was replaced by a typical city bishop. See, Peter was inspired. Blessed art thou, Peter, for my Father in heaven has revealed this to you. But not the city bishop. He was an appointed, elected official, ambitious, jealous, calculating, power-seeking authoritarian, an able politician and a master 
of public relations, and we have an immense literature on that, of course, in the Patrologium. This was St. Augustine's trained rhetorician. At the same time, the charismatic gifts, not to be trusted, were replaced as the gifts of the Spirit, were replaced by rites and ceremonies that could be timed and controlled, all following the Roman imperial model, as Alfeldi has shown, including the caps and gowns. Down through the century, the robes have never failed to keep the public at a respectful distance, inspire a decent awe for the professions, and impart an air of solemnity and mystery that has been as good as money in the bank. The four faculties of theology, philosophy, medicine, and law have been the perennial seed beds not only of professional wisdom but of quackery and venality so generously exposed to public view by Plato, Rabelais, Moliere, Swift, Gibbon, A. E. Haussmann, H. L. Mencken, the rest. What took place in the Greco-Roman world, as in the Christian world, was a fatal shift from leadership to management that marks the decline and fall of civilization. We pause. Ah, now that is foresight. <laughs> you didn't know I fooled him. Well, so this is that fatal. Now, at the present time, that grand old lady of the Navy, Grace, Captain Grace Hopper, the oldest commissioned officer in the Navy, is calling our attention to the contrasting and conflicting natures of management and leadership. No one, she says, ever managed men into battle. She wants more emphasis in teaching leadership, but leadership can no more be taught than creativity or how to be a genius. The Generalstab tried desperately for a hundred years to train up a generation of leaders for the German army, but it never worked because the men who delighted their superiors, that is the managers, got the high commands, while the men who delighted the lower ranks, the leaders, got reprimands. Leaders are movers and shakers, original, inventive, unpredictable, imaginative, full of surprises that discomfort the enemy in war and the main office in peace. For managers are safe, conservative, predictable, conforming organization men and team players dedicated to the establishment. The leader, for example, has a passion for equality. We think of great generals from David and Alexander on down, sharing their beans or their maza with their men, calling them by their first names, marching along with them in the heat, sleeping on the ground, and first over the wall. A famous ode by a long-suffering Greek soldier, Archilochus, reminds us that the men in the ranks are not fooled for an instant by the executive type who thinks he is a leader. For the manager, on the other hand, the idea of equality is repugnant and even counterproductive. Where promotion, perks, privilege, and power are the name of the game, awe and reverence for rank is everything, the inspiration and motivation of all good men. Where would management be without the inflexible paper processing, dress standards, attention to proper social, political, and religious affiliation, vigilant watch over habits and attitudes that gratify the stockholders and satisfy security? If you love me, said the greatest of all leaders, you will keep my commandments, if you love me. If you know what's good for me, says the manager, you will keep my commandments and not make waves. <laughs> That's why the rise of management always marks the decline, alas, of culture. If the management doesn't go for Bach, very well, there will be no Bach in the meeting. If the management favor favors vile, sentimental, doggerel verse extolling the qualities that make for success, young people everywhere will be spouting long trade journal jingles from the stand. If the management's taste in art is what will sail, the trite, insipid, folksy kitsch, that's what we will get. If management finds maudlin, saccharine commercials appealing, that's what the public will get. If management must reflect the corporate image in tasteless, trendy new buildings, down come the fine old pioneer monuments. To Parkinson's law, which showed how management gobbles up everything else, he added what he calls the law of ingelitants. Management do not promote individuals whose competence might threaten their own position, and so as the power of management spreads ever wider, the quality deteriorates, if that is possible. In short, <laughs> while management shuns equality, it feeds on mediocrity. The, uh, on the other hand, leadership is an escape from mediocrity. All the great deposits of art, science, and literature from the past on, the past on which all civilization has been nourished, come to us from mere handful of leaders. Because the qualities of leadership are the same in all fields, the field makes no difference. The leader being simply the one who sets the highest example. And to do that and open the way to greater light and knowledge, the leader must break the mold. To quote Captain Hopper again, she says, a ship in port is safe. She says, speaking of management, but that is not what ships were built for, she says, calling for leadership. 
To quote one of the greatest of leaders, the founder of this institution, there is too much of a sameness among our people. I do not like stereotype Mormons. Away with stereotype Mormons. Goodbye, all. <laughs> True. <coughs> True leaders are... That was just added. That wasn't in a speech, you know. No extra charge. <laughs> True leaders are inspiring because they are inspired, caught up in a higher purpose, devoid of personal ambition, idealistic and incorruptible. There is necessarily some of the manager in every leader. What better example than Brigham Young himself? Never a greater manager than for that matter. As there should be some of the leader in every manager. Speaking in the temple to the temple management, the scribes and Pharisees all in their official robes, the Lord chided them for one-sidedness. They kept careful accounts of the most trivial sums brought into the temple. But in their dealings, they neglected fair play, compassion, and good faith, which happened to be the prime qualities of leadership. The Lord insisted that both states of mind are necessary, and that's important. He says in the 23rd verse of the 23rd chapter of Matthew, This she must do, that's the keeping of the books and so forth, but not neglect the other. But, he continues, it is the blind leading the blind who reverse priorities, who choke on a gnat and gulp down a camel. So vast is the discrepancy between management and leadership that only a blind man would get them backwards. Yet that is what we do. In the same chapter of Matthew, the Lord tells the same men that they do not really take the temple seriously, while the business contracts registered in the temple they take very seriously indeed. I'm told of a meeting of very big businessmen in a distant place who happened to be also heads of stakes, where they addressed the problem, quote, of how to stay awake in the temple. For them, what is done in the house of the Lord is a mere quota filling until they can get back to the real work of the world. History abounds in dramatic confrontations between the two types, but none is more stirring than the epic story of the collision between Moroni and the Malachiah. The one, the most charismatic leader, the one, the most skillful manager in the Book of Mormon. This is both timely and relevant. That's why I bring it in here and it illustrates this. We are often reminded that Moroni did not delight in the shedding of blood and would do anything to avoid it, repeatedly urging his people to make covenants of peace and preserve them by faith and prayer. He refused to talk about the enemy. For him, they were always our brethren, misled by the traditions of their fathers. He fought them only with heavy reluctance, and he never invaded their lands, even when they threatened intimate invasion of his own. For he never felt threatened, since he trusted absolutely in the Lord, says Alma. At the slightest sign of weakening by an enemy in battle, Moroni would instantly propose a discussion and put an end to the fighting. The idea of total victory was alien to him. No revenge, no punishment, no reprisals, no reparations, even for, for an aggressor who had ravaged his country. He would send the beaten enemy home after battle, accepting their word for good behavior or inviting them to settle on Nephite lands, even when he knew he was taking a risk. Even his countrymen who fought against him lost their lives only while opposing him on the field of battle. There were no firing squads, and former conspirators and traitors had only to agree to support his popular army to be reinstated. With Alma, he insisted that conscientious objectors keep their oath and not go to war even when he desperately needed their help. Always concerned to do the decent thing, he would never take what he called an unfair advantage of an enemy. Devoid of personal ambition, the moment the war was over, quote, he yielded up the command of his armies and retired to his own house in peace. Though as a national hero, he could have had any office or honor, for his motto was, I seek not for power. And as to rank, he thought of himself only as one of the despised and outcast of Israel. If all of this sounds a bit too idealistic, may I remind you that there really have been such men in history, hard as that is to imagine today. You think of Epaminondas and Alexander and Aurelian, Claudian II, Probus, there have been such men. Well, above all, Moroni was a charismatic leader, personally going about to rally the people who came running together spontaneously to his title of liberty, the banner of the poor and downtrodden of Israel, as the 14th chapter tells us. He had little patience with management and let himself get carried away and wrote tactless and angry letters to the big men sitting on their thrones in thoughtless stupor back in the capital. And when it was necessary, he bypassed the whole system, altering the management of the affairs of the Nephites, we're told, using that word, to counter Amalekiah's own man man managerial skill. Yet he could apologize handsomely when he learned he'd been wrong, led by his generous impulses into an exaggerated contempt for management, and he gladly shared with Pahoran the glory and of the final victory, 
the one thing that ambitious gentlemen, uh, generals jealously reserved for themselves. But if Moroni hated war so much, why was he such a dedicated general? He leaves us in no doubt on that head. He took up the sword only as a last resort. I seek not for power, but to pull it down. He, did. he was determined, he says, to pull down the pride and nobility of those groups who were trying to take things over. The Lamanite brethren he fought were the reluctant auxiliaries of Zoramites and Amalekiahites, his own countrymen. They were told, quote, they grew proud because of their exceeding riches and sought to seize power for themselves. Enlisting the aid of those who were in favor of kings, those of high birth, supported by those who sought power and authority over the people. They were further joined by important, we're quoting still, judges who had many friends and kindreds, the right connections were everything there, plus almost all the lawyers and high priests, to which were added, quoting still, the lower judges of the land, and they were seeking for power. All these Amalekiah welded into it with immense managerial skill to form a single ultra-conservative coalition who agreed, quote, to support him and establish him to be their king, expecting that he would make them rulers over the people. Many in the church were won over by Amalekiah's skillful oratory, for he was a charming, flattering is the word used by the Book of Mormon, was a flattering and persuasive communicator. He made war the cornerstone of his policy and power, using a systematic and carefully planned communication system of towers and trained speakers to stir up the people to fight for their rights, meaning Amalekiah's career. For while Moroni had kind feelings for the enemy, Amalekiah says, Alma did not care for the blood of his own people. His object in life was to become king of both Nephites and Lamanites, using the one to subdue the other. He was a master of dirty tricks to which he owed some of his most brilliant achievements as he maintained his upward mobility by clever murders, high-powered public relations, great executive ability. His competitive spirit was such that he swore to drink the blood of Alma who stood in his way. In short, he was, says Alma, one very wicked man who stood for everything that Moroni loathed. It's at this time in the Book of Mormon history that the word management makes its only appearance. It's three of them in all the scriptures. First, there was the time when Moroni, on his own, altered the management of the affairs of the Nephites during a crisis. Then there was Korahor, the ideological spokesman for the Zoramites and Amalekiahites, who preached, quote, in this life every man fared according to the management of the creature. Therefore, every man prospered according to his genius, ability, talent, brains, and conquered according to his strength, and whatsoever a man did was no crime. He raged against the government for taking people's property that they durst not enjoy their rights and privileges, yea, they durst not make use of that which was their own. Finally, as soon as Moroni disappeared from the scene, the old coalition, quote, did obtain sole management of the government and immediately did turn their backs on the poor while they appointed judges to the bench who displayed the spirit of cooperation by, quote, letting the guilty go and the wicked go unpunished because of their money. I have a little side note here. All this took place in Central America. Such was the management that Moroni opposed. By all means, brethren, let us take Captain Moroni for our model and never forget what he fought for, the poor, the outcast, the despised, and what he fought against, pride, power, wealth, and ambition, or how he fought as the generous, considerate, magnanimous foe, the leader in every sense. At the risk of running overtime here, I must pause and remind you that this story I've just given just a few small excerpts is supposed to have been cooked up back in the 1820s somewhere in the backwoods by an abysmally ignorant, disgustingly lazy, shockingly unprincipled hayseed. Aside from a light mitigation of those epithets, that's the only alternative to believing that the story is true. For the situation is equally fantastic no matter what kind of an author you choose to invent. This must be a true story. Well. That Joseph Smith is beyond compare the greatest leader of modern times is a proposition that needs no comment. Brigham Young recalled that many of the brethren considered themselves better managers than Joseph and were often upset by his economic naivete. Brigham was certainly a better management than the prophet or anybody else for that matter, and he knew it. Yet he always de deferred to and unfailingly followed brother Joseph all the way while urging others to do the same because he knew only too well how small is the wisdom of men compared with the wisdom of God. Moroni scolded the management in the 60th chapter here for, for their love of glory and vain things of the world. And we have been warned against the things of this world as recently as the last general conference. But exactly what are the things of this world? An easy and infallible test has been given us in the well-known maximum, you can have anything in this world for money. 
If a thing is of this world, you can have it for money. If you can't have it for money, it does not belong to this world. That's what makes the whole thing manageable. Money is pure number. By converting all values to numbers, everything can be fed into the computer and handled with ease and efficiency. How much becomes the only question we need to ask. The manager knows the price of everything and the value of nothing because for him the value is the price. Look around you here. Do you see anything that cannot be had for money? Is there anything here you couldn't have if you were rich enough? Well, for one thing, you think of you detect intelligence, integrity, sobriety, zeal, character, and other such noble qualities. Don't the caps and gowns prove that? But hold on, I have always been taught that those very, the very things which managers are looking for, they bring top prices in the marketplace. Does their value in this world mean then that they have no value in the other world? It means exactly that. Such things have no price and command no salary in Zion. You cannot bargain with them because they are as common as the once pure air around us. They are not negotiable in the kingdom because there everybody possesses all of them in full measure. And it would make as much sense to demand pay for having bones or skin as it would to collect a bonus for honesty or sobriety. It's only in our world that they are valued for their scarcity. Thy money perish with thee, said Peter to a gowned quack, Simon Magus who sought to include the gift of God in a business transaction. The group leader of my high priest quorum is a solid and stalwart Latter-day Saint who was recently visited by a young returned missionary who came to sell him some insurance. Cashing in on his training in the mission field, the fellow assured the brother that he knew that he had the right policy for him just as he knew the gospel was true. Whereupon my friend, without further ado, ordered him out of the house. For one with a testimony should hold it sacred and not sell it for money. The early Christians called Christemperoi, those who made merchandise of spiritual gifts or church connections. The things of the world and the things of eternity cannot be thus conveniently conjoined, and it's because many people are finding this out today that I'm constrained at this time to speak on this unpopular theme. For the past year, I've been assailed by a steady stream all the time, visitors, phone calls, letters from people agonizing over what might be called a change of majors. Heretofore, the trouble has been repugnance of the student, usually a graduate, that he has felt that entering one line of work while he would greatly prefer another. But what can they do? If you leave my employ, says the manager, what will become of you? But today it is not boredom or disillusionment. It's the interesting thing. It is conscience that raises the problem. To seek ye first financial independence and all other things shall be added is recognized as a rank perversion of the scriptures and an immoral inversion of values. Next I'm going to skip a paragraph. Well, we mention here, uh, we talk about <clears throat> artists, astronomers, naturalists, poets, athletes, musicians, scholars, or even politicians. The idea being that it is only when their art and science become business oriented that problems of ethics ever arise. Look at your TV. Behind the dirty work is always money. There'd be no crime on Hill Street if people didn't have to have money. Now, Paul is absolutely right, you see, that Philargaria. The drive for wealth, the drive for money, is indeed the root of all evil. And he's quoting, incidentally, the old book of Enoch when he says that. In my latest class, a graduating honor student in business management who is here today, I'm going to ask to steal this from me, he wrote this. The assignment was to compare oneself with some character in the Pearl of Great Price, and he quite seriously chose Cain. He says, many times I wonder if many of my desires are too self-centered. Cain was after personal gain. He knew the impact of his decision to kill Abel. Now, I do not ignore God and make murderous pacts with Satan. However, I desire to get gain. Unfortunately, my desire to succeed in business is not necessarily to help the Lord's kingdom grow. Now, there's a refreshing business piece of honesty, isn't it? Maybe I'm pessimistic, he says, but I feel that few businessmen have actually dedicated themselves to the furthering of the church without first desiring personal gratification. As a business major, I wonder about the ethics of business. Quote, charge as much as possible for a product which was made by someone else who was paid as little as possible. You live on the difference. Unquote. As a businessman, will I be living on someone else's industry and not my own? Will I be contributing to society or will I receive something for nothing, as did Cain? While being honest, these are difficult questions for me. Well, they've been made difficult by the rhetoric of our times. The church was full of men in Paul's day, we're told, teaching that gain is godliness and making others believe it. Today, the black robe puts the official stamp of approval on that very proposition. But don't blame the College of Commerce. The sophists, those shrewd business and showmen, 
started that game 2,500 years ago, and you can't blame others for wanting to get in on something so profitable. The learned doctors and masters have always known which side their bread was buttered on and taken their place in line. Business and independent studies, the latest of the latecomers, have filled the last gaps, and today, no matter what your bag, you can put in for a cap and gown. And be not alarmed that management is running the show. They always have. Most of you are here today only because you believe that this charade will help you get ahead in the world. But in the last few years, things have got out of hand. The economy, once the most important thing in our materialistic lives, has become the only thing, as the man from Columbia said. We have been swept up in a total dedication to the economy, which, like the massive mudslides of our Wasatch Front, is rapidly engulfing and suffocating everything. If President Kimball is frightened and appalled by what he sees, I'm quoting him, I can do no better than conclude with his words. We must leave off the worship of modern-day idols and reliance on the arm of flesh. For the Lord has said to all the world in our day, I will not spare any that remain in Babylon, and Babylon is where we are. In a forgotten time, before the spirit was exchanged for the office and inspired leadership for ambitious management, these robes were designed to represent withdrawal from the things of this world, as the temple robes still do. That way we become more fully aware of the real significance of both is my prayer in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.